Jarvis, drop my needle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and I'm here with my dog Ace, who might make some noises while I'm recording tonight, uh, because he's just kind of slobbering all over the place and drinking water, and he's still on medicine. He's recovering from some recent heartworm shots that he's had, but we are finally done with a lot of his stuff, so it's good. He'll be on the men soon, and you know he's already slowly getting there, but uh, but yeah, so he's gonna hang out around me, so you might hear him make some noises and stuff. Um, but today we are actually going to review Savage Avengers. So this was something uh, that we, I already recorded the Lethal Protector one a little bit earlier, and now I'm sitting back down to get this one out there so I can try to get all this footage in, uh, because the hardest part's going to be me making time to edit these, but I'm trying to get these up as fast as I can. So hopefully you enjoyed that Lethal Protector one. If you've seen it, if not, you can go check it out now. Um, that was my previous Venom vlog episode. And today we're going to talk about Savage Avengers number one. And this one did not come with a digital code in the way that the Venom Lethal Protector one did. Um, there's like some kind of thing you have to go through and you have to get confirmation. And I don't know how all that works. So uh, so I don't have a code for this one, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but this book is uh, was different. So the Savage Avengers thing, if you remember back when Jerry Duggan first did Savage Avengers number one, I actually had him on the show, Free Comic Book Day, and he, you know, I did like a quick interview with him, and we had that as a Venom vlog episode. So I've always kind of kept my eye on the Savage Avengers because it started off with a symbiote in you know, the book, and we thought it was Venom, uh, but it turned out it wasn't really Venom. It was like an ancient symbiote or something. And then the character kind of never really came back in. I think there was one mention of him later on down the run, and then they did a lot of stuff with Doctor Doom. And I don't know, I was like, I kind of lost interest in the book overall. Uh, but now seeing this new version, I was uh, interested only because of Flash Thompson. Uh, I am a big Flash Thompson fan, and I became one because of this show. Like, I liked the character before, but him as Venom and Anti-Venom, I've liked a lot because of the show and, and us going through his run as Venom when he was Agent Venom, and then also the, um, you know, the stuff after Donny Cates' run where he came back as the new Anti-Venom and stuff. And actually before that, when Dan Slott made him like an Anti-Venom for a brief time. So it's cool to have him back. I'm so excited. So I wanted to see what adventure he would go on now that the Absolute Carnage story was done. And I wanted to see what they would do with him. And, and it, this one didn't disappoint as far as, uh, you know, Flash Thompson fan. I thought it was kind of cool that he was trying to, uh, that Alchemex, Liz Allen, contacted him and said, hey, there's something going on here. And he was like, oh, that's in Hell's Kitchen. That's kind of where Alchemex is. So let me go get Daredevil, and he recruits Daredevil, who is now Elektra, who is an old teammate of his back when Flash Thompson and her were on the Thunderbolts. So she's like, yeah, Thompson, yeah, thanks for calling me. I'm, I'm glad I could come and help you. Um, and, uh, and they go in and they just kick a bunch of butt. So I kind of like that. It was like, all right, there's a lot of throwbacks there. There's a throwback to Flash's connection to Liz. There's a throwback to the Alchemex building, um, it, it, its location being De uh, Hell's Kitchen. So you got Daredevil in there, which is Elektra now, who has a path for Flash Thompson also. So I kind of like that the writer paid attention to stuff like that. But outside of, you know, the cool little character moments that we get from time to time, I also feel like this writer is a, just overwrites sometimes. Um, that happens a lot. And I can understand the need for it because there's a lot of things going on in this book. So you, you have these like, you know, legends or little boxes that have information where it's expositioning a lot of stuff. And I get that you need a lot of that, but I hope as the run goes on, that's trimmed down a little bit and you just give us action and you have some of that, you know, some of it told in dialogue uh, because the way it's presented here is like, I don't know, it's, it, it, it kind of throws me off sometimes. There's, there's a lot on each page, which is fine. I mean, you get your money's worth, there's a lot to read, but I feel like a lot of it could be cut and you can just kind of show some of it or have it, uh, you know, presented in a different way. Um, so anyway, so this is David Popose, I think maybe is how you pronounce his last name, and I'm sorry if I'm getting that wrong, um, but, uh, but overall good. This is my first experience reading something that David has written, and it's, it's a good start, I think. I think overall this was an interesting book. I, as far as Savage Avengers goes, I kind of like this setup a little bit more than I did the original one. Uh, the original one, I thought the first issue was strong by setting up the characters, but, um, but, I, but that story just dragged, you know, for, for for real dragged and uh, and this one I feel like is getting right into it and so I'm like okay I kind of like that approach and Carlos Magno who's doing the artwork I think does a killer job uh, anything from doing like you know symbiote stuff or anti-symbiote stuff with Electra, then going over to uh you know uh, Conan there fighting 
serpent people and then also uh, taking on a death lock a time traveling death lock uh, I thought that was cool because I think that's one of the Rick Remender things where like there's like a death lock that protects the time uh, you know stream and so Conan has apparently committed a crime against the time stream by killing all these serpent men because I guess that was something that maybe had to happen for a timeline to exist and so this death lock shows up to stop him and what's cool about this death lock is he's kind of like an amazo type um, he's got a uh, things programmed into him like uh, taskmaster initiatives so he can copy people's moves and uh, and then that even shows up later on when um i think it's weapon h here uh turns into a hulk monster with wolverine claws and deathlock is able to absorb some of his strength and grow to like hulk size so i thought that was neat i'm like okay because i'm a big fan of things like amazo at dc comics or super adaptoid or something like that where it's a like or taskmaster even where it's someone who can mimic other people's moves I think that's fun to, a fun villain to throw a team at. That was actually one of my ideas for Suicide Squad for a live action movie was I wish they they had like Amanda Waller going, we need to reform criminals and, and make them, you know, go on missions for us. And if they disobey us, we just kill them with no remorse. And then maybe you have another, you know, guy in, you know, trying to pass his program and his is the Amazo program. And it has the powers of Superman and Wonder Woman already. And then it, it goes crazy and you find out that Amanda Waller made it go crazy so she could send her team in to destroy it uh, because she had a fail safe to you know get rid of it anyway or something. That's what I thought a Suicide Squad movie would have been fun with because then you would have kind of had the villains fighting the heroes because it's the powers of the heroes. And that's kind of what this writer does here. He has Deathlock kind of have these powers that the team has and he's kind of taking that on. So this Deathlock shows up to stop uh, Conan and try to sentence him to death and try to kill him and they get in a brutal battle where limbs are getting cut off and everything it's it's pretty cool and then like Deathlock grows the arms back um, and they continue to fight and they enter the time stream and they end up uh, it's kind of like the classic Avengers and even Justice League did this too uh, which they were good at in the beginning when they formed teams an event happens that brings the teams together. And that's always kind of like the thing. It's like fate, right? It's like, all right, when when we need a team to save us, they will form, you know, like and, and that's kind of what this book is, is this Deathlock and Conan get into this time stream thing and it brings in these other heroes. So all these other heroes are doing their own stuff. Cloak and Dagger are, are talking, you know, uh, Cloak's about to admit his feelings for Dagger again, I think, um, and say he wants to maybe try dating her and, and spend his life with her um so they're in the middle of that conversation and then you have uh weapon h who is teamed up with the black knight um because some guy was going to mug weapon h because he didn't know who he was and he turned into a hulk monster as dane whitman was getting drunk in a bar across the street and he's like oh someone's getting robbed i should go save that guy and then he shows up and it's like a hulk wolverine hybrid <laughs> so you got black knight in here you got cloak and dagger um you got electra you got uh, anti-venom and they all kind of show up at this uh, moment when Conan is fighting this, uh, you know, this super adaptoid Amazo Deathlock thing. And so they all get their licks in, they all fight them. And then by doing this battle, they interrupt the time stream uh, and their powers, I think Cloak's powers or something kind of goes haywire and they all get sucked into this void. And then the book ends with them back in the Hyborian Age, right? I think that's what it's called, uh, Hyborian Age, which is where Conan is originally from so all this time in these comics he's been in the marvel universe he's been trying to go home and you know and uh this is his moment where he actually gets to go back home and he's brought all the characters with him including the time traveling death lock so that's looks like that's going to be their enemy in this book so i don't know it's it's a little uh, rambunctious i guess is a good word for it and a little all over the place at times um but i think the writer was just trying to get everyone to a place and and has a lot of characters that they're trying to juggle so in this book i felt like okay you're getting a setup we know who these characters are so it's not like we need their origins or any of that stuff but um there was enough there to explain why they were in the places they were in but not really enough to explain why they get all pulled into this thing with you know conan and deathlock like uh, that is still a mystery on some level to me so uh, hopefully the series explains that and i might give it another i might pick them up digitally from now on but uh you know when i have if i'm able to or have time um, or have the extra money but uh but yeah i i might continue to read this for at least another you know issue or two just to see where it goes because this is an interesting team and there's some characters on here i don't know a ton about 
Like, I, I don't know that much about Black Knight, and I don't know that much about um, uh, Weapon H either. Um, so this will be kind of fun to maybe experience that, but also see if this Deathlock, because he's on the cover as like a possible teammate, if he'll stay a teammate or not, um, or if he'll still become a teammate, because right now he is not. Uh, but, so, you know, like in school when you, you get in a fight with somebody and then they become your friend later, maybe that's what's happening here with Deathlock. Uh, maybe he'll find out that Conan's not the real cause of the temporal time stream disruption and maybe it'll be something else. I don't know. Time will tell. But at least for this, for Flash Thompson, I got enough in there. Like, the, you know, these serpent guys set off this ma uh, mad bomb, which anyone in the blast radius, it made them kind of go crazy. So Flash actually does turn into this version of Anti-Venom for a brief second, which I thought was kind of cool. And it says the seeds have been planted and then maybe over time as the population is going crazy and they got to be saved, maybe these heroes over time will, or maybe they fought enough darkness in their time that it won't drive them crazy. So time will tell if there's going to be someone on the team that loses it because of this mad bomb and what the team's going to do to undo that you know, incident, um, you know, or save people. So I don't know. I, we'll, we'll see where the story goes from here. But for now, I thought it was enjoyable enough. And I, you know, overall, I was like, okay, this was fun. It's a little chaotic, but it's fun. And I'm curious to see where it goes. But if you agree with me or disagree with me, whatever it is, let me know down below. What are your hopes for, you know, Flash Thompson in this run? Are there any other characters in here that you don't know that much about, like me? Um, and which characters are they? And let's have a dialogue down below in the comments. Uh, whether you like it or not, you know, whatever your opinions are and whatever characters you want to talk about, characters you want to talk about, uh, let's do it down below. Uh, thank you so much for watching. As always, I'm going to go now because Ace is running around me and I think he wants to go potty. So I'm going to take him outside. So uh, thank you so much. I'll see you in the future. Peace.